Hi, welcome to class. My name is Don LaFon, Professor Don. And this week in our A plus software class, we are covering operational procedures. Actually, this is the last presentation, uh, pr presentation 19 in the textbook. And the author has thrown in quite a few different topics into this presentation. I think a catch all is probably the best explanation. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. If you're here with me uh, as uh, live, uh, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. I'll give you an opportunity to answer your que answer, uh, ask questions, and I'll answer them. Uh, if you are watching this as a recording inside of our Canvas classroom, please ask questions in the help forms. And if you're asking watching this out on YouTube, welcome to the presentation. I'm glad you're here. Hopefully, it'll be helpful for you. Uh, this series of 19 videos uh, has been uh, created uh, so to help you. Uh, the viewer to a pass your A plus certification. Of course, a deeper dive is probably necessary on many of these topics, but it gives you a good overview on each and every one of them uh, that should be on the presentation. Let me go ahead. See, we should be good. Let me start. Let me bring this over here. Start the chat room just in case students uh, have any questions that are with me right now. You can ask. Uh, via chat, or if I ask you a question, it's all, always helpful if you answer it. Uh, here, start the presentation. Surprisingly, it started in the right place, which is awesome. And let's go ahead and get started. Operational procedures. So this presentation cover, covers a review of communication skills. That's our soft skills section. And we'll talk about operational procedures. Qualities of a good technician. We've been covering one different quality each of the 19 or so weeks we've been together. Uh, this presentation talks about communication skills. So good, communi good communication skills are priceless. Use proper language, avoid jargon, acronyms, and slang. Uh, it's important to understand that the person you're trying to help may not understand even the simplest term. Uh, so if you say, uh, you'll see it on your CRT, for example, you and I, of course, know what that is uh, because uh, we've been using monitors for many years, but the person you're trying to help may not actually understand what a CRT is, or you throw out the term bandwidth and they wonder if they, you're talking about their belt or something. So make sure that the terms that you, you, you are using are not too tech savvy. And I like to recommend anytime you use an acronym, you spell it out. Uh, the first time you uh, use it. And that way, later, when you use it again, they'll know what you're talking about. And uh, actively listen, take notes, and avoid interrupting the customer, especially at the beginning. When they start talking, you want them often, especially if they're, they're upset, you want them to unload as much information as they, they have. You'll pick through it as they're talking and keep the important pieces in, in mind. And then, say something to the effect of, yes, I can help you with that, or you came to the right person, or I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll fix this, or I will, I'm sure we can fix this, let's get started, or something like that. Uh, and, that uh, and then if you need to take notes and, and, and ask follow-up questions on everything they told, that could be useful. Uh, be culturally sensitive. Uh, use appropriate titles, Mr., Mrs., uh, Dr., uh, and not only the way you talk, but heck, even something like uh, putting your feet up you have, uh, and, and showing the bottoms of your soles of your feet. Understand that the different cultures uh, around the world even have different um, sensitivities and you need to be aware of those sensitivity, sensitivities, especially if you work in a multicultural office. Deal, with appro deal appropriately with customers confidential and private materials. We actually talked about that earlier. If you see private material, confidential material out, uh, tell them you saw it, and that way they can deal with it. Uh, say, hey, I went in to, to start working on your computer and you had you know, com company secrets sitting on the desk, uh, and, I, and I, looked, I glanced at it to see what it was. I didn't memorize anything, but uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to let you know uh, before you know, so you can you know either change the secrets or at least remove the material so you won't see it anymore. Communication skills: be on time or notify the customer. If you're running late, it is better to send a message, text, or call or email, 
to say, you know, you're going to be 15 minutes late than it is to just show up 15 minutes and that late. And that's because when they're waiting for you, that's when they're getting upset. That's when they don't know if you're coming or not. Uh, so if you let them know you're running 15 minutes late or half an hour late, or if you need to even reschedule, let them know. Avoid distractions. Watch out for these personal calls, texting, social media sites, talking to coworkers while interacting with the customer, personal interruptions. Unless, unless the call or text pertains to the actual uh, job that you are performing, don't do it. Don't be talking to the wife about dinner. Don't be texting the kids about the birthday party. Don't do that. Uh, and wait till after you're done with your interaction with the, the customer, and uh, then you will uh, not be distracted when the customer is uh, trying to tell you something. And worse, uh, the customer won't feel like you don't care. You want to you want to make sure that they that they think you care. And if you're playing a video game while you're supposed to be fixing their computer, especially if you're on the clock per hour, they're not going to be very happy with that. Uh, set and meet expectations and timeline uh, for with the customer. If you tell them it's going to be an hour to fix it, make sure you think you can do it in half an hour. If you think it's going to be a day, tell them two. Uh, you know, you remember uh, Star Trek. I hate to bring up such an old TV show, but. Uh, but uh, Kirk always asked for a little bit more time, expecting Scotty to to provide it uh, in a shorter period. So you get if you know what I'm talking. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up. Dealing with difficult customers or a situation, do not argue with them or be def defensive. Avoid being judgmental. Clarify customer statements. Ask open-ended questions to narrow the scope. Instead of saying, "Does the computer work?" Yes, no. Say, when was the last time the computer worked? Uh, um, what was going, that's even a closed ended because they could say two o'clock. Uh, but what was happening the last time the computer was working? That would be a better question. And they have to say what was going on the last time they knew the computer worked. Uh, restate the issue, summarize, restate it back to the client. So you're not in like in the picture, uh, you know, removing the wrong leg on a on a on a patient, right? You want to make sure that you are removing the right leg. Uh, I hear in uh, operations on people, they'll put a big red marker before they amputate a leg uh, on the leg that's actually being removed, and they'll you know verify they got the right leg. I guess that happened a few times where if they didn't get the right leg. That would be bad, <laughs> or finger, or anything else that they're amputating. Uh, do not disclose experiences via social media outlets. So once you um, interact with the client, you don't want to jump online and say, oh, today I helped so-and-so do such and such. Don't do it, right? That your interaction, unless they tell you or they they posted or you ask permission or they better, they ask permission, uh, you want to keep uh, your experiences private uh, within the uh, within the two companies, your company, their company, or the same company if you're both working for the same. Ultimately, be professional. Operational procedures. Operational procedures overview. Electronics need to be protected from moisture, dust, extreme temperature fluctuations, and weight-bearing loads. Toxic fumes can cause degradation of components. Electric waste uh, computers, mobile device batteries, laser printer toner cartridges, and monitors is considered or are, con are considered toxic waste. To protect computer equipment with, with search uh, suppressors, personal enclosures, and clean room, uh, you need to do that. Uh, it's not quite written, right? Oh, I didn't read it, right? Uh, personal protective equipment and personal safety techniques are necessary. To properly handle and store electronic electronics using anti-static bags, ESD straps, and ESD mats. We covered that earlier in the class. Uh, basically, uh, grounding yourself before you touch equipment to ensure you don't damage the equipment. And anti-static bags are great for storage. Equipment grounding, self-grounding, and fire safety knowledge is important. Now, we cover these in depth as we move through the rest of the presentation, so I won't go too deep with any of them. But most of them are pretty obvious, right? You don't want to pour a pitcher of water on top of the, uh, you don't want to even set or sit 
a uh, pitcher of water on top of a server or or even a can of Coke or Pepsi, or whatever you drink, uh, because if that gets knocked over, there's a good chance you're going to you're going to have some electric waste, all that equipment that's going to fry from you spilling water into it. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is a division of the Federal Department of Labor. OSHA promotes safety and healthy working conditions by enforcing standards and providing work, workplace safety training. In addition to OSHA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA standards, and local government relations recognize that workplace environments should be free of harmful and or hazardous chemicals and situations. An important form required by OSHA is the Material Safety Data Sheet, MSDS, which outlines handling storage procedures, disposal, and first aid on all potentially harmful and hazardous materials. Um, I, I'd like to just share that when I was in the Navy, uh, they had us filling out MSDS sheets for every everything that was hazardous, everything from uh, the uh, uh, maybe a little grease that we used uh, to lubricate uh, something uh, to uh, the cleaning supplies that we used. And it always seemed like it was just a Navy thing. It was just uh, the Navy uh, making us do extra work for the sake of extra work. And, and then I got out of the Navy many, a couple decades ago, get out of the Navy and found out that, hey, the real world cares about you too. And ultimately, uh, all of these proceed, uh, all of these organizations are there to, to keep you safe from harmful, harmful or hazardous materials in the worksheet. By having an MSDS sheet, ultimately, uh, you can find out how, what to do with uh, MSDS when you have a spill, for example, or, or you have maybe a, a, a um, uh, I always I always joke around. We used to have an MSDS sheet on lead-based paint. It's like, wait a minute, it's lead-based paint. This sounds dangerous. It's lead-based paint. <laughs> uh, after a while, sailors were not exposed to lead-based paint anymore. But you get the idea. You should have an MSDS to talk about what happens if you get paint all over you and what to do about it, how to clean up, how, what to do with the the uh, the clothing that was um, was exposed to it, etc. Fire safety. If a fire occurs inside a computer or peripheral, unplug the equipment if possible. Do not put yourself in harm's way attempting to do this. Quick information. Okay. Class A fires involve paper, wood, cloth, or other normal, normal combustible materials, usually sitting around a computer, not necessarily in the computer, unless you have a wood computer. Anyways, class B involves flammable liquids and gases. Again, uh, you're probably not likely to have liquids inside of your computer, at, at least not flammable. I, pr I have water in my computer, uh, but if there was a leak, it might short the equipment, but it's not gonna itself catch fire. And then we have class C fires. They involve electrical or electronic equipment. That's what you're going to experience if you have a piece of electronics a router, a switch, a PC, a printer, catch fire, that's gonna be a class C fire and they can be really dangerous. When we're talking about safety equipment, we there's a couple they point out here, personal protective equipment, including goggles and a dust mask, gloves perhaps. Uh, your uh, dust mask um, should be of a, a quality that, uh, is, that, that depending on the job, it may have to be a higher quality if you are interacting with fumes, for example, instead of just cleaning equipment. Personal safety. Remove jewelry, watches, dangling necklaces, earrings, and ID lanyards that could get caught, hooked, or entangled in the equipment. I think I mentioned in this series how um, I, I was the, uh, uh, in the Navy, I was the um, sailor who got to make these videos on how to repair this equipment. And I was in the video all day long. We worked on it, took multiple takes. I felt like a movie star, it was fun. Uh, until the next day, actually it was a week later, uh, that my, my boss came to me and said, hey Don, uh, you, why didn't you take off your wedding ring? I said, I never take off my wedding ring. I can't, it won't come off. My wife bought it small for me, so it just won't come off my finger. And he said, well, guess what? We've got to record all of those videos again. And since you can't 
you can't take off your ring. You won't be the person doing it this time. And so a whole day of my life uh, and my movie, my movie uh, making career was over because of a wedding ring. Ah, who knew? Who would have known? But it's important because any type of um, con conductible metal like gold uh, that comes in contact with electronics can ultimately cause a short. Just thinking about a motherboard being open, if I run my, a live motherboard, first of all, I shouldn't have my hands in there. But if I have my hands in there and it's touching pins on the back plane of a motherboard, there's a good chance I'm going to do some damage. So be, be cautious uh, and uh, remember to remove those uh, type of devices before you start working on equipment. Uh, dis disconnect power cords. Be sure that the work area is clear of liquids, coffee, soda, water bottles, water bottles, for example, and foods that may spill or contaminate the equipment. Remember to use lifting, good lifting techniques. Use your legs, bend at the knees, not the waist. Uh, anytime uh, you're uh, you're lifting anything, even if it's less than this 40 to 50 pound weight limit, uh, you need to be aware of the fact that you can get hurt and, uh, and companies don't want uh, you on disability. They want you there working. So be aware of what you're lifting and, and try to avoid being hurt. Be familiar with the location of the nearest fire extinguisher and where the nearest fire exit is to your workplace. Computer disposal recycling. Computers and other electronic devices contain materials such as valerium, chromium, cadmium, lead, mercury, nickel, and zinc. Plastics that are part of computers are hard to isolate and recycle, but many electronic parts can be recycled. Cathode ray tubes, CRTs, are found in older displays, and TVs usually, and TVs usually contain enough lead and mercury to be considered hazardous waste. In Florida and New York, steps have been taken to increase CRT recycling. However, other states regulate all CRTs as hazardous material and ban them from being sent to the landfills. Uh, I once, once went to a big retailer and asked them to take my CRT, uh, and they, they, they actually take um, old electronics. Um, I'm not going to tell you the company. Uh, but I thought it was silly when I got to the desk and the, and the guy asked for $25. And I said, what do you mean? You want $25 for me to give you my broken monitor? And they said, yep. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And so I brought it back home and I put it back in my garage. I, I think it might still be out there. I'm not sure. Uh, pile, stuff piled up on top of it. But, but um, at the moment, at that moment, I decided I wasn't going to pay uh, to... Disposer, but the reason ultimately why some companies want uh, money for recycling is because they don't make money from the recycling the parts, but they are saving the account, saving the uh, our environment. So it's worth doing. I think today I probably would go ahead and give them the twenty five dollars, uh, especially since I keep kicking that monitor that's in my screen, in my computer, in my. Um, garage. Uh, going back to the top, some companies actually do make money uh, collecting the materials that are in the first paragraph there, nickel, nickel mercury, lead, zinc, chromium. Uh, they actually make money collecting it. So that's one of the reasons why the big box retailer near me does collect it. They just send it on to these companies, but I guess the companies don't want CRTs. Tone of safety and disposal. Safety point. Here are some safety points pointers to remember about tone of, tone of safety. Remember to always wear some type of rubber or nitrile, uh, nitrile uh, gloves. Uh, they're, they're the rubber free gloves and a dust mask when handling toner cartridges. Inhalation of toner particles poses respiratory damage equivalent to smoking. Do not attempt to clean any loose toner particles with a regular vacuum sweeper uh, as the toner particles may seep into the vacuum's motor and melt. Always use a high efficiency particulate air, H uh, HEPA, H-E-P-A, vacuum bag in the vacuum cleaner. Otherwise, you're gonna suck it in one end and blow it out the other. Uh, always allow the printer and cartridge to cool before repairing or replacing. 
The fusing assembly and heat toner can cause severe burns. We talked about that in printers, how, how much electricity they are, and accordingly, uh, if that equals heat. Proper component handling and storage. Remember to use anti-static bags for storing adapters and motherboards when not in use for extended periods. Actually, any piece of electronics should be put in an anti-static bag. Motherboards, uh, uh, hard drives are obvious, but so are peripheral cards that you're adding, uh, such as a sound card, for example. Uh, when repairing a computer, wear an anti-static strap, ESD strap, uh, and or heel strap to prevent um, an electrical shock from going from your body to the equipment and damaging the equipment. Place a computer that is being repaired on an ESD, uh, they don't, they, the word isn't here, uh, but an ESD mat. An ESD mat is just a flat mat uh, that uh, doesn't conduct electricity. Uh, if an anti-static brass strip or anti-static heel strap is not available, it is recommended that after removing the external case, you rest your non-dominant arm on an unpainted metal part, leaving your dominant hand free to work on other components. The key here is ensuring that your, your level of electric, electrical charge is equal or neutralized by touching the case of the computer. Equipment grounding. Equipment that is grounded is at the same voltage potential so that someone is not shocked and or the equipment is not damaged. Network rack or battery backup systems might have a grounding wire attached. I've seen it uh, with the uh, equipment that we work with. Everything is grounded to the rack and then the rack is bolted to the concrete um, floor. Concrete floor. Um, so it is um, uh, unlikely that you are going to get electrocuted uh, by standing on that that concrete floor, but it is possible, so always be cautious. Adverse power conditions. So uh, we talk about over voltage and we talk about under voltage here. An over voltage could be a spike or a surge. A spike lasts one to two nanoseconds. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. A spike is harder to guard against than a surge because it has such a short duration and high intensity. Then there's a surge. A power surge lasts longer, three or more nanoseconds than a spike, also called transient voltage. Cause, the causes of surges include lightning, poorly regulated electricity, faulty wire, and devices that could turn, turn on periodically, such as an elevator, air conditioning, or your refrigerator. Basically, they have that big surge at the beginning when it first comes on. Under voltage, Brownout, sag, or blackout. A brownout, power circuits become overloaded. Occasionally, an electric company intentionally causes brownouts to reduce the power drawn by customers during peak power. The power isn't lost completely. It's just brought down to a lower level than usual and then brought back up again. Some equipment cannot handle that, that drop. Sag. A sag occurs when the voltage from the wall outlet drops momentarily, and blackout is a total loss of power. That's definitely under voltage. Power protection. Computers need a steady stream of AC that the power supply converts to DC. Sometimes the AC voltage is too high or too low. Protection can be provided with the following devices. Surge suppressors. They protect against over voltage. A surge suppressor protects against overvoltage and may include a warranty. Uh, you may have a, a surge suppressor strip, for example, uh, that you plug a bunch in and it says that it covers up to 10,000 watts. Well, how do you, have you ever, I want to know down below in the comments if you've ever had a um, company that tells you a surge suppressor with a warranty ever actually follow up and pay you for the TV that went or the or the computer that tried. Um, I wanna know, please, down below, if you've ever even tried to get money from one of these companies. 
but they do they do offer the warranty so it can make you feel like it should cover that much um that voltage level now ultimately in the fine print it often says we will replace the search suppressor which is great if you my tv is gone and my computer's fried you're going to uh give me a 20 dollar search suppressor but so make sure you read the the details a uh, line condition it conditions the AC voltage from the wall before passing it on to the computer. Uh, UPS, I, I actually mentioned to you that I, I have one of these UPS, uh, one similar to what you see in front of you uh, here in the picture. And this, um, uh, well, it's a real one. That's just a picture. But, but it has the actual voltage on it uh, that I'm getting from the wall. And, and it's never 110. It's never 110. It's either 115 or 105 or 107. It varies. Uh, that's what the line conditioner uh, aspect of that uh, volt that um, UPS it it um, conditions the voltage. And then if I lose power, if there's a short power outage, the UPS actually po powers the material until the equipment uh, comes back on. UPS stands for uninterruptible power supply. Uh, SPS provides power during an out out outage. So your SPS. Uh, could actually, uh, for example, I have a, a friend, I don't have one, but uh, I have a friend that has an ex, uh, outside generator uh, that powers his house and it provides power even if there's no power in the area due to an electrical storm or whatever. Uh, companies often have an SPS uh, that will provide power so you can keep working even if there's no power in the surrounding buildings. You can still be productive <laughs> at home. Uh, depends on how important it is. Uh, you know your time at home. If you're just watching TV, yeah, maybe you don't need an SPS. But if you live in Florida and uh, you get hit by a hurricane and you lose power for a week, sure is nice to have your your frozen goods and maybe even a little air conditioning. Anyways, that's uh, power protection. IT documentation, that's probably what you thought we were gonna talk about uh, in this presentation, uh, but we finally got to it. IT documentation, the types of documentation include topology diagrams. They can be physical or logical. Physical network diagrams show how things are wired and locations of devices. Uh, logical show the IP addressing uh, and the names of equipment such as uh, router one, rack one, or switch to rack two. Uh, and uh, so most of the time you have both. You have a physical network diagram that shows what is located and, and where it's located. And then you have the logical that shows how it's connected. High level diagrams show the connectivity between sites. Incident documentation used for billing and budgeting. It's also used by other technicians when other problems arise. I recommended before in this presentation keeping a log in uh, or near the equipment uh, cabinet. Uh, whenever you make changes to the equipment, for example, say you find that there's a port that is no longer working on a switch, uh, you know it, but does anybody else know it? And you move the port over the PC that's connected to that port and the equipment comes up and you determine that port is damaged and not gonna work. There's 24 ports, you're only using 16, plenty of extras, but go ahead and indicate it in the documentation what the problem was, what the troubleshooting was, what the ultimate outcome, and the fact that that port is no longer uh, working. Uh, you may not need to replace the equipment, but you definitely wanna keep an extra eye on it uh, to make sure you don't continue losing ports on that equipment. And at, at some point, you're going to not trust the equipment and you're going to replace it. Uh, and other tech and leave that available for other technicians. It doesn't help for you just to keep those notes in your laptop. And then when somebody else goes out, they don't have those notes because then they won't know about one or more ports that are down or any other issues that you've identified. So keep that as a local documentation. You can keep it as a docu documented in your computer as well for you but not for the somebody else that's also working with you, your teammates. Inventory, inventory management. An inventory management system is used to document a company's assets. Technicians commonly have to interact with the system. Uh, we 
uh, may have to add asset tags, which actually identify the equipment. Uh, we may have to do inventory. Uh, at the college I work for, we used to have to do inventory, uh, but they changed it and now they just hire somebody to come through in the middle of the night and inventory everything. I would not want that job, but it's pretty easy. Just like this woman in this picture, she just goes up to the back of every computer and zaps a barcode and that indicates that that piece of equipment is still there. Pretty easy job. Boring, but pretty easy. I have no idea how much she gets paid, but I'm glad I'm not doing it. Change management. Change management is a formal process for choosing and implementing IT changes. Uh, assets, what is the purpose of the change? Do, uh, do, a risk, oh, do a risk analysis to determine uh, what the outcome would be to replace the equipment. Uh, for example, it's a silly example, but uh, if you need to, for example, upgrade the CPU and all the computers uh, because they're just not able to handle the, the upgraded applications that you're currently running in a classroom environment, you have to replace the CPUs with faster CPUs. Well, you also need to determine uh, what else needs to be replaced. You know, do you need to replace the RAM? Do we need to replace the cases? Uh, you know, if we're going to a smaller form factor, or do we need to replace the software that's running on the computer? That that all needs to be uh, within a um, computer information systems management design, uh, and then ultimately a risk analysis to talk about the cost and um, the dangers of upgrading. You say dangers, what could be a danger? Well, I, I a, co a local company here in the city I work at, uh, they can't ultimately replace any of their legacy database equipment, some, even some old computers that are running the database equipment, the database software, uh, because they can't, they don't have the, a means to uh, import the data from the old database to the new database without a time, uh, a major time uh, effort by people actually manually entering the data. So they just leave that equipment running uh, and uh, and hope that it doesn't break because I guess if it breaks and they'll be that's where there's a an out. What's the danger of keeping it? What's the danger of changing it? Design, what is the scope of the change? The timeline, who does what? What resources are needing? And, and um, what is the back out plan? If you start the process and let's say this happens on a regular basis, let's say you start the process and it doesn't go accordingly uh, here at the college, every now and then IT says they're going to make a change over the weekend and the computers are gonna be down for 12 hours and, uh, and Nine out of 10 times, they come back online in an hour and they say, we're done. It was faster than we thought. Well, they're just allowing them to, themselves more time. Uh, but what if it goes to 24 hours? Again, they have to make a decision whether they're gonna back out of the installation of the new hardware or software, or they're going to just send out a message to everybody that it's taking longer. And there has to be repercussions. There has to be, uh, when, you've, when you're determining this, you in the plan, you have to determine at what point are you going to decide to do it at a different time, uh, and at what point can you change that? Uh, implement, execute the plan, document the changes, have an end user acceptance process where somebody actually tests and makes sure that the equipment works the way it was intended to work, and evaluate, ensure that each part of the plan was done properly, and document, document, document to ensure that there are not only a history of what changed, how it was changed, but also maybe how to use the new hardware or software that you just implemented. Well, that's it. Uh, this information came from the complete A plus guide to IT hardware and software, a textbook by Cheryl A. Schmidt. Uh, it is designed for the CompTIA A plus certification. If you've watched all 19 of my videos, uh, then you are, I would say, probably, and you, and you understand the material, I would say you're probably 70% there uh, when it comes to taking the exam. Uh, if, you, if you paid attention and learned the material, if you've gone beyond and each topic that you didn't know, if you actually um, ask uh, questions, did some research, watched some more videos online, 
uh, then uh, you will be higher than 70%. I don't want to give you a confidence to say, watch my 19 videos, go take the exam, because there's a lot of little details that I don't call, I don't cover uh, that I'm afraid uh, that um, students uh, probably, those, especially those of you that don't have the textbook, um, you, you are not reading the material. Uh, these presentations have all been designed to get you thinking about the topic, give you an interview, uh, an overview, uh, and to get you some basic information and then a deeper dive is always in encouraged in everything you learn in IT. All right, so that's my presentation. Uh, it's been a pleasure teaching you all of these uh, lessons uh, in the A plus um, courses here at the college I teach for, for both A plus hardware and A plus software. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, that you passed your A plus certification. So uh, when you uh, take the exam, remember to return and uh, and comment on one or more of my videos, just telling me that you you took the exam and you passed. We'd love to hear it. Uh, if you have any additional resources that you find helpful, please, by all means, add them to my in the comment section below my video uh, to help your fellow students out. Um, I am uh, con now that I'm this week, I'm done with my videos for A plus hardware and soft software. I'm jumping to my Cisco three videos. So uh, on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe, give me that thumbs up and subscribe and you'll have my. Uh, first of all, it'll be easy for you to find me, but also you'll have my uh, my um, easy to find me, and you'll have my a notification if you hit the bell, the notification when my, those Cisco three videos come out. Cisco one uh, networking, Cisco two networking are already out there. Those videos are for the CCNA certifications. So, anyways, uh, it's been my pleasure helping you. Thank you for coming to class. Uh, it, that's all I've got for you today, uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing from you in the future. Uh, thank you for coming to class.